for attending this lecture at the Institute of World Politics today. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of the event. Lee Edwards is a distinguished fellow at the conservative thought of, in conservative thought at the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's a leading historian of American conservatism and the author or editor of 25 books. Edwards also is adjunct professor of politics at the Catholic University of America and chairman of a foundation that dedicated the victims of communism memorial in Washington, D.C. in 2007. His books include biographies of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, William F. Buckley Jr., and Edwin Meese III, as well as histories of the Heritage Foundation and the American conservative movement. His works have been translated into Chinese, Japanese, French, Hungarian, and Swedish. Edward's next book, um, or book, was um, called, entitled <laughs> A Brief History of the Cold War, um, was published by Regnery in the spring of 2016. Um, Edwards was the founding director of the Institute of Political Journalism at Georgetown University and a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He is a past president of the Philadelphia Society and a media fellow at the Hoover Institution. He has appeared frequently on broadca broadcasting cable outlets such as Fox News Channel, CNN, Bloomberg, NBC, PBS, C-SPAN, and NPR. His work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, um, the Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, National Review, Human Events, Claremont Review of Books, and the American Spectator, among other places. His awards and honors include the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary, the Millennium Star of Lithuania, the Cross of Terra Mariana of Estonia, the Friendship Medal of Diplomacy from the Republic of China, Taiwan, the John Ashbrook Award, the Reed Irvine Media and Accuracy Award, Legend of Yath from New America's Foundation, and the Walter Judd Freedom Award. Edwards received a doctorate in world politics from Catholic University as well as Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Grove City College. He did graduate work at the Sorbonne in Paris. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Duke University. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. It's a great day to be alive, especially because I'm going to be talking about communism this afternoon, which is a rather unusual subject in this city. Uh, matter of fact, some people are not even willing to accept that there is such a thing as communism anymore. And so I'm pleased and honored to be chairman of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which is dedicated to informing not only Americans, but citizens around the world of the history, legacy, and ideology of communism. And we're very, very busy these days. I have to recognize in the front row the, the president, chairman, CEO, commander-in-chief, and every other thing of uh, the Institute of World Politics, John Lanchowski. John, you may not remember, but, but you and I had a, I believe it was a luncheon, it may have been a breakfast, at the Hyatt on Capitol Hill, about 1990 or 1989, in which we talked about your starting this it kind of an institute. We talked back and forth, and uh, I encouraged him, I was, I was one of many who encouraged him to do that. The only thing I said was, John, it's going to take longer than you think to get it going <laughs> and to get it started and to keep it going. And, but John had, Lanchowski has done the most incredible thing by starting and sustaining and expanding this institute. And for that, he deserves all the credit in the world. And terrific, and my, my hat's off to you, John. Thank you. Well, I think it's true that rarely in history as a political movement and its leaders promise more and produce less than communism and its dictators, from Lenin, Stalin, Mao, to Castro, Pol Pot, and Kim Jong-un. Truly, 
Bolshevism was the god that failed. The god that failed. So, what have we learned about this ism that's responsible for the deaths of more than 100 million victims around the world? So what I'm going to do with this afternoon with you all, and then we can take questions and answers, to talk about some of the more common myths of Marxism. Number one, communism has never failed because it's never been tried. We probably all heard that. In reality, the communism has been tried in nearly 40 different countries since the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. It's been tried in large industrial countries like uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, and in small agricultural countries like Cuba. And communism has failed every time because it rests on two false assumptions. One, private property is a modern phenomenon that can be easily eliminated. And two, human nature is infinitely malleable and can be readily refashioned. Well, in fact, as we know, private property has been at the center of civilization since biblical times. It's in the Bible all over. And as regards human nature, human nature is the product of the laws of nature and nature's God. It is there. It's in our DNA. It's in our society because it is in our DNA. The communism has failed abysmally. And how do we know that? Well, there are many, many ways of measuring that, but we can certainly look at it through the stubborn resistance of dissidents in every communist country and the bravery of freedom fighters in places like Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968, Solidarity in Poland in 1980, and Tiananmen Square in 1989. Myth number two. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, was one of the great thinkers and prophets of the 19th century. Well, Marx and his close colleague, Frederick Engels, developed a doctrine of so-called scientific socialism, which states that an egalitarian society without private property, not only should happen, but by reason of economic evolution must happen. Assuring the proletariat they had nothing to lose but their chains, Marx closed his manifesto with the famous call to arms, workers of the world unite. And relying on his doctrine of scientific socialism, Marx's followers pursued a goal of a global revolution, confident in the eventual liberation of man. But Marx, that so-called infallible prophet, did not foresee the emergence of what? A prosperous and burgeoning middle class founded on what? The existence of private property. Richard Pipes, the eminent Harvard historian, said Marxism was dogma, dogma masquerading as science. It's a pretty good summing up of uh, communism and Marxism. Myth number three. The Russian people enthusiastically supported the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. But communism did not come to Russia through a popular uprising, but was imposed from above by a small militant minority hiding behind democratic slogans like, all power to the Soviets. In fact, industrial workers constituted only 2% of Russia's population, and only 5.3% of workers belonged to the Bolshevik party. Therefore, the communist chosen course of action was to rule through, what, a dictatorship and a quote, a dictatorship not of the proletariat, but over the proletariat and all the other classes. And that dictatorship continued for the next seven decades in the Soviet Union until it collapsed of its own ineptitude 
1991. Myth number four. The communists delivered on their promises to give the Russian people bread, land, and peace, which famously is what they promised the, the Russian people when they came to power in 1917. But in reality, the communists of uh, 1917 initiated first a bloody civil war in Russia between the Reds and the Whites, which continued for years, then conflicts in Europe. Uh, they were even trying to take over uh, Poland, for example, and the Soviet Red Army was rejected by the Poles in that time. Take a look also at the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression treaty of August of 1939. It allowed Hitler to concentrate his armed forces in Western Europe and Stalin to invade Poland and occupy the tiny Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. A little sidebar here that the United States government, and that happened 1939, 1940, the United States government never recognized the occupation of those three Baltic states. And my father, who was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, wrote a story. He visited the legations or the embassies, if you will, of those three Baltic countries and met with, quote, the ambassadors who were so grateful because we here in the United States did not recognize that Soviet occupation and dominance of their countries. And that's not all. In the closing months of World War II, the Red Army advanced on a thousand mile front, taking Warsaw, pushing into Germany, and moving into Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So soon, an Iron Curtain descended, turning the countries of Eastern and Central Europe into Soviet satellites. So during that 46 year Cold War that ensued, Russia and its East European collaborators, joined by China, North Korea, Cuba, North Vietnam, or Vietnam and Cambodia, among others, conducted a steady campaign of agitation, propaganda, and often armed conflict. Why? All in pursuit of the Marxist-Leninist goal of a communist world. It's sometimes argued, for example, that, well, the Soviet Union was, was merely sort of operating in its own region, trying to establish a sphere of influence so they would not feel threatened by people in the West. But if that is so, why did it form a communist party here in the United States in 1921? In 1921. The reason is because from the very beginning, Lenin saw the United States capitalist, the capital of capitalism, as the primary opponent, which had to be matched and had to be taken over if they were going to bring about their goal of world domination. Despite their promises, communists failed to deliver the goods. And from the birth of the Soviet Union, there was strict rationing of food, clothes, and living space leading to large families living in tiny apartments with scant electricity and running water. Exceptions, though, were always made to the nomenclatura who led a privileged and cosseted life. The nomenclatura, of course, were the members of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. I recall in 1988, when I visited the Soviet Union, I saw a Soviet luxury in, um, in action. If you went to Red Square, one side of the square was gum, this gigantic department store where all of these wonderful goods were available to the Russian people. And I got a little bit closer and I saw a hundred women almost wrestling on the sidewalk outside of gum. I said, well, what, what's going on? Got a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And what had happened was that on sale had gone shoes. And the Russian women bought the shoes on the inside of the department, then came out on the sidewalk, and then were exchanging back and forth and ripping off their shoes, putting on other shoes. 
sometimes wrestling for the right size of shoes so that they could get themselves a pair of the right size shoes. This was, was communism. This was Marxism. This was Soviet prosperity in action. As to land, well, one of the very first acts of every communist regime is to seize all the land and set up giant communes that routinely lead to widespread famine, as in Ukraine in the 1930s and China in the 1950s and early 60s. The example of that in China is particularly um, shocking um, and, and blood curdling. In the very first year of the Great Leap Forward in China, some five million Chinese died as they took all of the land, put it in these communes, and then uh, forced people to depend upon that. Well, of course, famine resulted. And they went to Mao, Chairman Mao, they said, well, Chairman, comrade, uh, the things are not doing so well. Five million people. <coughs> so what? We have 400 million, keep it going. End of the second year, 10 million Chinese died. And they went to Mao and they said, uh, com comrade uh, Chairman, uh, 10 million have died. Uh, could we keep, keep going, keep going? Third year, 20 million Chinese died. Uh, in the great so-called Great Leap Forward. So after the deaths of some 35 million, we don't really know. Could it be 40, could be even more than that who died as a result of that so-called Great Leap Forward. That, again, was communism in action. This was Chairman Mao's taking his little red book and putting it into practice. Myth number five. Stalin was the great dictator who initiated a reign of terror to retain the communist hold on power. Well, there's no question that Stalin was a monster. That's what Robert Conquest called him, a monster. Uh, Robert Conquest, the great uh, uh, scholar and author of some of the great books about, about Soviet communism. But the reality is that Lenin was a fanatical Marxist and established a ruthless despotism first which Stalin extended and perfected. Lenin defined dictatorship this way, power that is limited by nothing, by no laws, is restrained by absolutely no rules, and rests directly on coercion. He was prepared, he said, to resort to unlimited terror to destroy my opponents and to cow the rest of the population. Lenin abolished all legal institutions, turning the application of justice over to revolutionary tribunals, headed, of course, by reliable party members, and to the new secret police, the Cheka, which was the predecessor to the infamous KGB. It was Lenin, not Stalin, who instituted the system of forced labor camps, the Gulag, that Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote so eloquently about decades later. The gulag to which millions and millions of political and other prisoners were sent in the decades to come. And Applebaum and others have estimated that perhaps as many as 10 million, perhaps even more than that, died in the gulag camps over the years. Following in Lenin's footsteps, Stalin ruled absolutely and with an iron fist. And there are three examples of the blood-stained rule of this man. The forced famine in Ukraine, which I already made reference to, the Holodomor, in 1932 to 1933, that took the lives of at least 7 million Ukrainians and others who were herded into giant collective farms. And of course, again, they, they failed miserably. There was no food available. There were even signs and reports of cannibalism, uh, of humans eating humans. Of course, that is not what the readers of the New York Times learned about what was going on in Ukraine. Walter Durante, who was their Moscow bureau chief for the New York Times, was writing, oh, well, there, mm -hmm. there, there, there's some hardship in Ukraine. Yes, there, there's some shortage of food there, but there is no, no, famine, no famine. All the while, Mr. Durante 
was drinking champagne and gouging down down his gullet of Kaluga Beluga caviar. Um, <clears throat> privately, he admitted there was something going on close to it, but he would not publicly admit this or write this for the New York Times. And as a result of which, he got a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> a Pulitzer Prize for telling the truth about one of the most horrible, horrendous acts against humanity in human history. But Stalin was not uh, satisfied with that. It was also the Great Terror of 1936-1938. This was a campaign of show trials and executions that took nearly a million lives. So again, Robert Conquest wrote a marvelous book. If you haven't read it, you must take a look at it, The Great Terror. What was Stalin doing? Well, he was eliminating all of his rivals. Anybody with the least possible uh, power or influence, he eliminated. With a had somebody with a pistol to the back of their head, with a firing squad, and other means. It was also the 1940 Katyn Forest massacre of some 22,000 Polish leaders, military officers, civil servants, landowners, intellectuals, priests, and policemen. Why? Well, they would have been the leadership of Poland when the Soviets arrived. Stalin was eliminating the opposition before it could begin to coalesce to make sure <coughs> not to be any challenge to him in his takeover of Poland. When someone alluded to the ever-growing number of victims, Stalin is alleged to have remarked, death solves all problems, no man, no problem. Myth number six, there are no more communist countries. The reality is that there are five communist regimes that retain their power through the suppression of human rights and the denial of the most elementary political rights. They are China, 1.4 million people, and 92 million Communist Party members, which is one of the reasons why they're able to control so many people as they do. Cuba, Vietnam, North and South. North Korea, and the one country, and I've, I've asked this question, and I think maybe with this group would have been okay, but if I had asked you to name the five, I think probably most of you would have gotten four out of five, but people forget that little Laos, poor little Laos, has been under communist control since 1974. Uh, it's, it's an overlooked, tragic fact of human history. I've been to China. Um, traveled there over a decade ago. And looking at the many skyscrapers of, in Shanghai and Beijing, so sort of, oh, that's very impressive. Look at all that going on. This must be a capitalist country in the making. It's not a capitalist society. It's a captive nation ruled by a communist party that lives by the old Maoist <coughs> slogan that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The party and the People's Liberation Army are one and the same. Economic liberalization, which started well with, with Deng Xiaoping in 1969-1970, thereabouts, has not produced political liberalization, although some Western experts keep predicting it will. Still, Chinese dissidents cannot mention publicly the Tiananmen Square Massacre of 1989 without being placed under house arrest or in jail. When I was there and in, in, uh, lecturing both in Beijing and Shanghai, I would bring up the Cultural Revolution and people would nod. I would bring up the Great Leap Forward and they would say, oh yes, that was bad, that was not good, it should not have happened. And then I would say, and of course there is the Tiananmen Square. No more nodding of heads people drawing back and not wanting to get into that to this day. The fact that to this day will not admit that there was a massacre. We don't know. Perhaps a thousand, maybe more students died in Tiananmen Square on that June day of 1989. China qualifies as a totalitarian society when judged by whether it allows free speech, a free press, the rule of law, 
religious liberty, an independent judiciary, and free and open political elections. <clears throat> Myth number seven. Nazism was responsible for more deaths than communism. If I were to ask any of you how many died in the Holocaust, I know that everyone here would come up with the right answer. And that would be six million Jews, right? Six million Jews died in the Holocaust. And that's, that's as it should be. It was, it was a great a great crime and a great evil uh, which was committed um, by Nazi Germany. And we've learned that uh, through uh, books that we've read in our schools, uh, articles, movies, TV programs, and so forth. But what about if I ask you how many died under communism, what would your answer be? Now, I know there's some many experts here who probably could come up with the answer, but if you ask most Americans, they might say 5 million, they might say 10 million, but certainly they would not say 1 hundred million. How do we know that? We know it because the Black Book of Communism, written by six French intellectuals of the left and published by Harvard University, calculated that that is the figure of at least 85 million. And this book now is some 15 years old and perhaps as many as 100 million. And of course, if Harvard University published it, right, it must be true. Right? We have to accept that, of course. What price communism? And I can't, you can't just put it in terms of, of numbers, you know, 100 million. I mean, our minds even try to come up with that figure, you know, 100 million, we can't even begin to to calculate, which by the way, was more than all the dead of all the wars of the 20th century. That's the magnitude of it. The Chinese philosopher Lin Yutang, for example, listed the little terrors, the little terrors that prevailed in China under, under Mao. Making children of 12 subject to capital punishment. Sending women to work in underground coal mines. Harassing workers during their lunchtime with threats of prison if they were late in returning to work. There were the costs and terror. One Soviet defector wrote about Soviet life, quote, We lived in a world swarming with invisible eyes and ears. That's the world in which they lived. There were the costs of thought control. The content of everything, print and broadcast, was limited to, quote, authorized truths. The leftist French writer and Nobel laureate André Gide said, after visiting Stalinist Russia, quote, I doubt that in any country of the world, even Hitler's Germany is thought less free, more bowed down, more terrorized than in Soviet Russia. There were the costs of the world. There was no crisis anywhere in the world from Southeast Asia to the Caribbean, from Africa to the Middle East, in which the ideological ambitions of Moscow, driven by Marxist-Leninist thought, was not involved throughout the 20th century. There were the costs in moral values. Soviet Russia under Lenin and then Stalin was the first totally immoral state, which treated immorality as a virtue, derided scruples, and acknowledge no limits on its action beyond its own will and goals. So this was and is the reality of communism. A pseudo-religion posing as a pseudo-science enforced by political tyranny. One of the wisest men in the past century, who lived under both Nazism and communism, summed up the main errors of Marxism. Pope, now St. John Paul II, wrote that Marxism denies man's personal autonomy. Quote, 
Socialism considers the individual person simply as an element, a molecule within this social organism. Marxism denies the right to personal property. Quote, man loses the possibility of personal initiative and becomes wholly dependent on a social machine. Marxism denies law and replaces it with force. Its view that the end justifies the means inevitably leads to terrorism and war. And finally, Marxism denies freedom. It detaches human freedom from obedience to the truth and from the duty to respect the lives of others. This is the reality of communism. These are some of the myths which need to be exposed time and time again. Communism, a god that failed, a science that never was, a political system that sits abandoned and bereft on the ash heap of history. Thank you.